Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you to these amazing panelists. Um, as Caroline was saying, we are in, this is not a new conversation. You know, the power of story is the, in all, what Sundance is basically for. Um, but we are, it does feel like we are in a moment. Um, we are wondering what's the post Harvey era going to look like? What does it mean when we talk about making America great again? Um, there's a lot happening in the culture and it feels like there's an opportunity for change. Um, some of that's good and some of that is backsliding and I, the people that we have assembled today are really culture makers um, and people who are responsible in a variety of different ways, either people who are in works of art or people who are like Patrick and Megan who are thinking about how um, cultural diplomacy can actually work. So I'm just gonna introduce everyone. Um, I'm having a major contact high with like a variety of people on this panel, but first I'll start with Octavia Spencer, who is of course an Aquaman actress. Um, she, won, she won an Oscar for her role in The Help. She played a major role in Fruitville um, Station. Uh, she also was responsible for my children's absolute favorite scene in a movie ever, which is when she stole a library book in Hidden Figures, which they <laughs> like think is the greatest thing. Um, she is one of eight women to have won an Academy Award, so I think that's pretty Ooh. incredible. Eight, eight African-American women, I'm sorry, excuse me. Big, big really miss, sorry. yeah. Um, Megan Smith is the, uh, in addition to having a, uh, a bunch of really cool jobs before, um, she was the third chief technology officer um, in, uh, in the, for the history States. of the country, yeah, um, in the Obama administration, and she's somebody who is actually interested in using technology to help make society better, um, and she's a good person to talk to if you're just worried about technology as a boogeyman that's gonna ruin your privacy and hand the Russians the election every four years. Um, Christine Vachon is uh, a absolute powerhouse indie producer. She is responsible, I have to look at my notes for this, because she's just made so many incredible movies. Um, if you liked Carol, which was nominated for six Academy Awards, Far From Heaven, four Academy Awards nominated, um, Still Alice, which won an Academy Award, Boys Don't Cry, Kids, going back to Hedwig and the Angry Inch, you have her to thank. Um, she's somebody who takes indie film and really knows how to make it mainstream and cross over. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what that has been like um, for her, Patrick Gaspar, our next panelist. Um, is the most is the culturally most interesting political operative I've ever come across because he has worked in politics for a really long time. Um, he was from 2013 to 2016 the ambassador of South Africa. He was an assistant to um, the president Barack Obama, and he has been involved in. He's now the president of the Open Society um, and is thinking a lot about how culture, the, the, the very topic here. So I told him he's sort of the scientist who's gonna tell us how all these different pieces um, of our Frankenstein <laughs> experiment fit together. Um, and last but certainly not least, Issa Rae, who is um, indeed worthy of all that applause and she sort of needs no introduction, but I noticed when I was doing uh, a little bit of research She's named on, on so many 30 under 30 or 35 under 35 lists. I feel like you're just here to make me insecure about my age. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she is, of course, the star and writer um, for Insecure, which is in its second season on HBO. <laughs> Um, and has had this incredible, um, I mean, we'll talk a lot about the show, but just this incredible transformation too from a YouTube sensation to real, you know, HBO, like the, the panacea of what most people think of as, um, as culture making. So you'll, I'll be interested to hear you sort of talk a little bit about that. So that is who we, are, who we have here. We're gonna start really briefly. I'm gonna make, what? I'm going to defer to Issa. I've heard about it, I'll try it. We'll pass and it if, back to you. Yeah, no, they, everyone's supposed to interrupt each other. Patrick has promised to like, you know, beat people up and make it all really interesting by the end of the panel. Um, <laughs> but we're gonna do sort of past, present, and future. Um, and I wanna start briefly with Megan, who has some interesting, S visuals and statistics about sort of where we are when we and what we're looking at when we look at the screen. So. Yeah, so uh, I just want to show you guys a, a graphic. One of the, you know, when I was, I started to see this uh, at Google, when I was at Google and then later, how missing images in the tech sector I was in were really creating huge problems in confidence. 
And so this particular image is one, uh, I love the internet, people just make things. So this is a group called polygraph.cool slash films if you want to find it, the pudding. They just went counted, who gets to speak? So this is data science meets media. Down here is children's TV. The blue is men's lines. The, the pink or, or red is women's lines. So look what we teach our children. Men speak, women don't. Constant, like a propaganda, and, and we didn't mean this, we've inherited it, that's there. So when we grow up, what do we make? This is 2,000 contemporary films. These are the lines for men and the lines for women. And we have seen extraordinary work from Gina Davis and USC with Stacey Smith and others who've been telling us, and all of you guys have been feeling this, but when you can use data science as one of the greatest American data scientists, Ida B. Wells, and I'm gonna tell you about her later in the program, used, you can see it. Last graphic I'll show you up here, this is by age. So the blue, as men get older, they get more voice. And as men get older, they get less. And there was an interesting moment that in the interview with Mark Hamill, where he was with George Lucas, they were asking Carrie Fisher and Mark if they would come in the new series, and, and George said one thing, and Carrie's like, I'm in. And Mark's like, why'd you jump in? He's like, there's not enough parts for me. So you can see it right there. What, why did Carrie do it immediately? The second graphic is from some new tools. You guys use uh, Alexa and Siri and all these tools. You use, we're going to have self-driving car, face recognition. There's a very mature industry coming from AI, machine learning, data science that we use to better see and do things, robotics. Let's apply that to the content we're making. So in this case, the USC team, uh, this was back when I was at Google, we got a grant to him. Computer scientist, Dr. Sri is feeding the content of Star Wars into a system that's looking at, instead of manually counting, which is too hard, uh, what happened in New Hope to Rogue One for voice of women and men? These are the lines. You can see there was almost no voice of women, and we get better. And this is by race. You don't think the New Hope unless you really look, and look at what we're doing. So this is a kind of tool right after the table read with the script. After the dailies, we could really use these tools, like the self-driving car tools, and we could use them to see how sexist, racist, racist, ageist were we that we didn't mean to be. And this is not to ask the directors and the screenwriters to change what they intend. It's just to be more conscious and use this stuff together with our own creativity. And then from that point, you make, make a different decision. You might change a character, you might change a line. Right. We'll get into some more stuff, but yeah. just wanted to share that. And it really, really matters because tech is coming into everything. <laughs> and so we can use this for our, our industry. Um, so with those sort of sobering statistics. <laughs> um, Issa, I wanted to ask you, when you were starting out with your series, did you think you were making something political? Did you ever feel <laughs> that way about it, or were you just trying to do something that was true to your own? Um, it was a little of both. It was just, uh, it came, it was born out of frustration of not seeing, you know, specific roles um, or people that I knew on TV mm -hmm. and people that reminded me, reminded me of my friends. And, you know, I was, I had a film blog, a television blog, and I was talking a lot of mess just about, like, why can't there be this on television? Or why, how hard is it to show this? And then, I remember there was a commenter, because I had like, what, like 20 readers, and there was a commenter who was just like, wow, you talk a lot of shit, why don't you just make something? And I didn't realize I could, and I was like, okay, I will. And <laughs> I made it so that I could continue to talk shit afterwards. <laughs> like, well, I did my part, so what, what's wrong? And then didn't expect that, that it would um, launch my career. So thank you to that blogger, I mean, to that commenter. <laughs> who said, you're talking a lot of shit, why don't yeah, you put your money uh, that's where your correct. Is? They were correct. <laughs> Um, you know, someone, there's, sorry? there's someone who became president through a very similar process. Talk about <laughs> <shit. laughs> Turns out talking shit is the way forward. Build a constituency for the shit. And the <laughs> totally, totally. I am offended. <laughs> totally, totally. This is about your power. Thank you. Doesn't um, feel like it. Christine, <laughs> Christine, you've talked about um, a, lot of the, a lot of your choices not from a political perspective, but from as a businesswoman and serving, well, talk about that a little bit, because I would have thought before we had a conversation that you were trying to do something really overtly political, but, and maybe you are, but you also have a real bottom line. I mean, you know, look, it's, I, I, I always shudder a little bit at the separation that like, you know, you're either a, you know, a, a filmmaker who aspires 
solely to, you know, uh, phil philanthropy right. or altruism, or you're, you're a business person. You know, usually when people hear the term film producer, they're just like, oh, you're the one that writes the checks, you know? And I guess one thing that was incredibly empowering for me at the beginning of my career was um, we made a movie called Poison that came to Sundance. Uh, and won the grand jury prize. It was my first movie, so I was like, how hard can this be? <laughs> Never did it again. <laughs> just, just so you know. Uh, but, um, but, but Poison was a movie that uh, had a lot of complicated themes based on uh, gay sexuality and, and the AIDS crisis, which was you know, very much raging at the time. And Poison taught me that if you made a movie for the right amount of money, um, it could play simply to a gay and lesbian audience, which was desperate for images of itself, uh, and it could still be profitable. And we, while I was discovering that, there were many other filmmakers discovering the same thing about other kinds of niche audiences that were terribly underserved, um, uh, like Julie Dash and Daughters of the Dust, or Spike Lee and, and, and uh, She's Gotta Have It. I mean, just there were other, other people figuring out like, wow, we can tell a story and we can aim it at a very specific audience. This was all pre-internet and, and it can give us a kind of liberty mm -hmm. to tell the stories we want to tell mm -hmm. because people are going to go see them. Another movie that did that a couple years later at Sundance was Go Fish, Rose Troche's first movie, um, which, you know, again, showed uh, a group of, you know, multicultural women just discovering, discovering love. It started after they were, had come out, and it was the only lesbian movie, I think, of its kind, of its time, <coughs> and we, it, did, it, it did enormous business, it sold really well, but again, it was incredibly liberating to think like, you know, you can make you can a movie like that. this, right. and that audience will come out and support it, mm -hmm. and that's all you need. And you don't need to worry about crossing over or making a mass film. I mean, it's great if well, you sure. do, right. and now it's different, this right. was a different time, but at the time, it just, it was, it was incredibly empowering in terms of the kind of stories that you can tell mm -hmm. and who your audience is. And those things I think anybody on this panel would say is still incredibly empowering. Mm -hmm. Octavia, you once said that 98% of the scripts I'm sent have everything to do with my race, <coughs> not, who am I, not who I am as a woman. Mm -hmm. And it's, very hard emotional, it's a very hard emotional place to be in, playing women with no emotional agency who have no voice whatsoever about the outcome of their life. So I'm now to the point where if a script has anything to do with race and history, I'm not the person to come to. That's absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, in talk about that though. Well, I mean, I made a joke about this and, uh, and, and bear with me. So, um, you know, it took me 15 years to become an overnight success after doing The Hell. <laughs> and I played a maid, and I loved every bit of, of that character, a, a woman, 1960. Fast forward to, I don't know, four or five years later, I play a mathematician at, uh, in Hidden Figures who works at NASA. And then just one year later, I play a maid who works at NASA. So um, <laughs> all women from the same era and, uh, you know, it's only three times that, I, that I've uh, uh, played a woman from the 60s, but it's been enough because I, I do have Madam C.J. Walker. Mm -hmm. um, she's from a different time, uh, you know, the 20s. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then um, I am collaborating on a Fannie Lou Hamer uh, story. So I know that they're doing Ma Hattie McDaniel's story, and I think that is an opportunity to uh, allow another young African American woman the chance uh, of a leading role, I don't need. You're going to gonna stand by on that. One. I'm going to. I'm going to pass the baton. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's interesting because you also, you see, you said that um, Insecure is very, very black at one point. That's true. What yeah. do you mean exactly by that? <laughs> I was so curious. Um, and Patrick, I'm coming to you right now. I think people are often surprised that we don't necessarily consider the white audience in making the show. And um, I find that like interesting. Like we don't talk about in the writer's room, like well, what, 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 do we need to translate this for white people? What will white people think? And it is very much of a place of, 
you know, it starts with friends and family. Like, um, I, know, I know that's who I write for, just the people that are in my life. Will this make them laugh? Does it, will it resonate with them? Does it resonate with um, me, obviously? But just, I've seen, to, in order to make something uh, commercially broad or, or, or successful, you have to have that white validation, and that just was never in, interesting. For, in, I was not interested in that mm -hmm. for this show in particular. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to tell a very specific, um, very black story, but at the, at the same time didn't feel like it needed to represent all of black people. And so in that sense, I wanted, to just, I wanted it to be pure um, from a specific lens, and that in and of itself allows it to be universal. And the most satisfying thing is to have you know, people of color come up to me and say, wow, the show resonates with me. And then even like older white dudes will be like, I know this is not for me, but I, I watch right. it. And I'm like, well, how did you even know about it? Where did you find it? <laughs> and um, I feel like, you know, as long as we're able to stay true and authentic to ourselves, then um, we'll be able to continue to tell true and authentic stories. And I have to just say one thing to the audience, because you're participants in this conversation as well. I was astounded when Megan threw up the, those graphics and showed uh, the very few instances where uh, women, people of color, speak on screen, and I heard a gasp in the audience, and I yeah. thought, really? <laughs> like, this is, like, this is news to you all, right? I remember being a kid when A New Hope uh, came out, uh, and then when The Empire Strikes Back comes out, and we saw Billy Dee Williams as Lando Calrissian on screen, and we were all so excited, and then we were shocked that he actually had lines, and then stunned that he wasn't killed off like five <laughs> minutes into the movies, right? Like Richard, Richard Pryor used to always joke that when white people envision the future, we ain't in it. So I'm really <laughs> stunned by the reaction of the crowd to, to some of that. And, and Megan, uh, I was a little taken aback by your comment about how uh, sometimes uh, filmmakers, artists, uh, don't intend uh, to be biased and, and have a particular kind of prejudice that, that's projected. I think there's a lot of intention in it, and I, and, you know, I talked to too many of my friends in the arts community who will say, well, we're being told that we can't be in this movie because it's hard to sell black folks or women in the, in the global market as protagonists in stories. So I think there's a tremendous amount of intent behind the investment uh, and what uh, ultimately comes out. I, I agree with that 100%. Yeah. And so, just you think but, that goes, but, 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 but to answer that? your question, I, yeah. to answer just, your question really about- Just let me fast one, which is I totally agree with you. And the, the part that I was getting at is a very specific and we'll get into later, which is when we retell history, um, it's so inaccurate and it's really destructive on our economy. Well. And so we'll get into that in a minute, but I completely agree. There's intentional and then not even bothering to do the research correctly because you didn't know you were supposed to but look at the picture. That, that's right, but we put a lot of money behind that, right? Yeah. The, the historian Carl Becker uh, wrote that history is uh, what the present chooses to recall about the past. So yes. your, your question about cultural uh, inspiration and yeah. uh, how it's guided me uh, into politics is, is, is central uh, to that. I've always understood that there's really uh, no, no gap or bridge between culture and, and uh, politics. Uh, I was raised in a, uh, uh, by a uh, Pan-Africanist uh, father of Haitian descent uh, in uh, the, the, the US, uh, and uh, he helped us understand that people like um, uh, Leopold Senghor and Amy Césaire and Kwame Nkrumah took uh, culture as a central tenet uh, in political mobilization and building of community. So as a kid here uh, in uh, the uh, United States, uh, it was not uh, surprising uh, to me to see uh, not only the, the dearth of examples of people like me on screen, but it was always like profoundly, profoundly motivating uh, anytime you came across a voice like Paul Robeson's voice, for instance, in those rare flashes that you would see or hear uh, someone like that, or uh, in times when uh, the media, uh, I, I see it in, in the US, in the world, I see no difference between the news media and entertainment as well, but when the news media would focus for an instance on someone like Andrew Young, uh, when he became the US ambassador to the United Nations, for me that was a cultural moment uh, and a moment of shift, and I heard his name and I let it mean me. And I could tell you examples from my early organizing in the anti-apartheid movement where I came at uh, the struggle through the work of people like um, uh, uh, John Connie and Athel Fugard and Miriam Makiba, and I got a, a, a sense of solidarity with their struggle, first through the art, uh, and, uh, and then was motivated. Conversely, 
We have too many examples uh, in uh, this country and throughout history of times when art was entirely propagandistic in a way that exploited uh, right. masses of people like the birth of, uh, right. the, of Hollywood, which is birth of a, birth nation, of a nation in 1915, which, you know, uh, obviously well, took it was, the story in a different yeah, direction. Yeah, I mean, it was like the Star Wars of its time. It was enormously popular, and I think that... It's a huge blockbuster. It was the first movie that was screened in the White House, and the President of the United States then said it was accurate history that was written in lightning, right, Woodrow right. Wilson, so... I mean, and, and that's sort of what we're up against. I feel like we're kind of living in a moment of cultural backlash, um, even as we're pushing forward on a lot of different um, fronts. And I, I open this up to anybody um, who's had an experience, whether it's something that you've made, something you've been in, Patrick, something you've seen, or Megan, where you've, it, where you've actually seen that, you know, why does that happen? Well, I can tell you from personal experience, when Viola and I uh, were starring in The Help, you know, we were excited just to be able to bring voices to uh, these uh, women who basically held the country yeah. <laughs> on its back. And, and to, even though they weren't representing real women, they were representing scores of people mm -hmm. um, and whose lives had value. Um, but there was a lot of backlash. And I, I totally wasn't expecting that, uh, to have to justify why we as black women uh, it's 2011 and you guys are playing maids. It's like, wait, well, hold on. Let's, let's, let's talk about what this conversation is really about. Mm -hmm. Is it that you hate the idea of black women being shown this way at this time? Is that what you're upset about? Uh -huh. Or is it, um, the idea that, uh, that these stories aren't valid. They wanted um, you to be lawyers or something. They wanted you to be something right. more like, professional. To, and and to me, it. it's hollow if, if it, oh, I'm a lawyer, right. but right. I have nothing, <laughs> there's n no depth to that character. So uh, it, was, it was shocking because of course it was my introduction to uh, having to do press and, right. and having to confront that issue. Um, but it was nothing that I shied away from because uh, you know, again, we still have people in our lives that facilitate our lives, you know, um, and, and, you know, cleaning ladies, uh, nannies, uh, people, you know, I'm playing one now, and it, and it took right. a Mexican man to Dude. give my character, who is subservient, uh, agency. Right. Uh, I was talking to Patrick about that, and I said, oh, I, I was joking about playing, playing Minnie Jackson, and then the evolution of Minnie Jackson to, to Zelda, um, because Zelda did have agency. Mm -hmm. But it was very disheartening to have to uh, confront that um, when it felt like a very proud moment. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. This, this was a very live, real-time, animated discussion for a lot of us in the community, right? Because the help uh, received rightly outsized attention, your performance is absolutely brilliant in it and sees the imagination of lots of folk. But for a lot of us, right, but, but for a lot of us, there was a lively debate about, well, you know, do we only win uh, the award when we have a particular kind of representation, right? Are we back at the Hattie McDaniels period? But we're not, and you're right, that there are millions, millions of women, like the women in Help, who are not only black, not only brown, but also white, mm -hmm. who are facilitating our lives, whose stories aren't told in a way that gives them, uh, as you said, agency uh, and lifts up uh, their dignity. I think that I'm yeah, experiencing a little bit of what you uh, mean by uh, a moment of backlash. Uh, I had the good fortune to serve as the national political director for a skinny guy with a funny name who became president of the United States uh, in 2008. Uh, and then Is that I. Again? Uh, the Barack Obama guy. Then I was fortunate enough to, to um, help uh, re-elect him uh, in 2012. Uh, and if you had told me that um, the person who was one of the, the chief promulgators of the birther narrative and story right. uh, would uh, succeed uh, him as president, I probably would have defined that uh, as backlash. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, uh, but but I but I think that. That, that um, uh, for me, it's more funny except it's not. <laughs> well, said it's funny except not really. Well, <laughs> well, th well there it is. That's, that's actually where I was going. Yeah. Uh, it, it, in politics, I have not experienced it as backlash, right? So many of my friends in 
New York and California have been wringing their hair out about the challenges that a certain political party has with the white working class and how uh, this uh, election is a manifestation of that. And I have to stop my liberal friends and tell them, actually, this is not backlash. And there hasn't been a single instance since the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965 that uh, a Democrat has won the white vote uh, in America, right? So there is a, when we, the power of story and culture shifts, uh, following the election, we're all talking about the white working class vote and how that swung the election. Well, last I checked, Donald Trump won uh, white Americans who earned $50,000 or less by 20 points. White Americans who uh, earn 50,000 to 100,000 by 28 points. White Americans who make more than 100,000 by 17 points. Doesn't sound to me uh, like it's necessarily a cultural backlash or a news story uh, in our country. I'm much more concerned not with the cultural backlash, but instead with the inability of some folk in my community to appreciate that uh, progress is not assured and history is something that you always have to impose your will on and it's not good enough to just be woke on Twitter or Facebook, <laughs> but you gotta uh, have that, give that a different kind of civic expression. You know, uh, on the National Archives it says vigilance at all moments and so it's our time. Um, one of the things that I did was, uh, my friend created a tech jobs tour and just to go across the country and try to get Americans to meet each other. And so we've been to 25 cities um, across Appalachia with coal miners who are retraining and founding tech companies. And one, one of the groups, BitSource, Drill Bit, Source Code, in this tiny town, um, advertised for 12 slots and they got 800 people trying to get those jobs. Um, so the Americans are trying to get themselves back together and the Dalai Lama right after the election wrote, you know, people are worried about being unwanted, unneeded. Uh, and so I think that there's not only all of everything you guys are, that we were just saying, which is very real, uh, and it's this moment of that. And there's also these other things going around It's this transition like the industrial age that we're in, into automation and creativity and stuff. And how are we gonna really bring everyone into that? Mm -hmm. um, in a way, and story is a big part of it. And so I'm by scouting and scaling for what's working. Like the venture capitalists don't make the companies, they just find Twitter, Facebook or whatever. So how do you make these systems less accelerating of some and debilitating to others? So that all of the talent of this country, 90% of venture capital goes to men, 75% uh, of it goes to three places, New York, San Francisco Bay Area, and um, uh, Boston's, so we were just with Rise of the Rest with Steve Case, driving around this bus, he's awesome. Right. And what, 1% to African American founders? Wow. And the truth yeah. and reconciliation equivalent of playing those humans mm -hmm. who lived and still got it totally done, even though they were oppressed in this position versus the top position, you have to have it on screen. Yeah. Do you guys have an answer for what that is? Is it showing positive images on screen? It's great that we're, that we're having this conversation. Uh, and I'm inspired to be up with all of these incredible sisters who are uh, shifting the industry in the ways that they can. But I know that how uncomfortable I felt when I took uh, my son to go see Transformers as a blockbuster and on screen every other scene was about uh, this young man, a young man and the young woman who was being objectified. Uh, every scene in that movie and regrettably that has so much more power here and overseas than uh, anything uh, that uh, will shift and surface as a consequence of Harvey Weinstein being exposed. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I mean, that's where, the, the, those are the big blockbusters. I mean, the Transformer movie is not going to be shown at the next Sundance, I don't think, but we're in rarefied space. But where's our advocacy in yeah. that space? The, the advertise, National Adver Association of National Advertisers, ANA, 200 billion ad buy, um, a subgroup of them that has Unilever and Procter & Gamble and Walmart, Associate Alliance for Family Entertainment. We worked with them and they launched the See Her campaign, and so they are actually transforming their industry. They're using some of these tools, but they are working on reducing the objectification uh, and the confidence debilitating content of advertisements themselves and using tools and consciousness and will, right. and they're also working on buying better. 
buying stuff that's better for all of us, more healthy for all of us. I want to talk about female sexuality um, on screen, and I want to go to Issa, because you're doing, um, your character is so interesting because she's not afraid to, exp you're not afraid to have her express um, her own sexuality in ways that, that I haven't seen that much on screen. I just wonder if you could talk about that a little bit in terms of the choices that you made when it comes to representing um, Issa, your character's sexuality on screen and the way that she's pursuing relationships and where that came from. Yeah, I think it came from, I think growing up in the 90s and seeing black bodies used in a way that I felt like were familiar to me, that, you know, in the ways that my friends talked about, in the ways that, uh, in, in showing love for one another, um, in very human, naturalistic ways. And I think in the last 10 to 20 years, you know, black bodies have been used in terms of uh, torture porn, right. uh, to ridicule, um, and I just wanted to shift the focus back to, again, black people as humans. And, it, and you know, we make love, and it's uncomfortable at times, right. and, you know, there's, there's just, um, a normalcy to it that we, we just hadn't seen in a long time. Like, I hadn't seen uh, two black people make love on television in such a long time, and then even just exploring um, the, the dynamics beyond that. And for us, it was just about having those conversations um, in the room, and especially in, 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 in following two dark-skinned characters, two dark-skinned female characters. Like, the, it, it just felt like, and not to harp on a colorism, but that's a very real thing, that you know, certain types of black women aren't allowed right. to have love or be able to show love. And um, for us, that was an, an important conversation, and for me personally. And chubby women. And chubby women. Yeah. Well, it's funny, we were, yeah. I mean, I was watching a film with my, I guess. Yeah. You trying to, I'm trying to the show, <laughs> yeah. and I want a part written for me. <laughs> Say no more. Octavia's gonna fuck in insecure season. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, we're, we're all gonna tweet that after this. Give her her part. Give her her yeah. seed. <laughs> like, let's come on. Let's hook Octavia up. I please. <laughs> 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 I took my daughters to see a movie recently where a white guy fell in love with a very light-skinned African-American woman, like so light-skinned, they were like, why are they not allowed to be together? And I was like, well, she technically <laughs> has brown skin, but they wouldn't cast anyone with really brown skin in that role because that would be just like too much for everyone. And they, there's my nine-year-old like, huh. And I, wonder, and I wonder who makes, I mean, I know who makes, degree, those, who makes those decisions, who, who decides like, you know, we're no, trying to she doesn't look good, but this and one is, the, the yeah. Chinese won't watch it if it's, if she's any shades darker, you know, and I, I always wonder like, who are those executives who make those decisions on behalf of everyone? Christine, and to be able to you have a, that's, that's yeah. the, that's the million dollar question or the $10 million question. And we deal with it all the time, you know, not just uh, uh, anything that's female driven. You know, not even if it's uh, female of color driven, just anything that's female driven. Our joke about Still Alice was always like, too bad it's not called Still Alice and John, because <laughs> then it would be a lot easier to make. Yeah. You know, right. it, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, a real, uh, it, it, it's a real issue. And, um, and those conversations, you know, they're very, as Donald Trump would say, locker room. You know, where people really are like, yeah, you know, she, like, it won't work with her, it won't work with him because of these, you know, uh, of issues that are very specifically, yeah. you know, racial and gender oriented. But are you having those conversations? Like, can you, could you, if you are wanted you in to, that out those room when execs they're if you wanted to? Because I know but for I, me, I'm like, sorry, that was an issue. Could you out those execs if you wanted to? For me, it came down to, you know, being vocal about a specific executive who told me that very, the same thing. And, you know, he, he got fired at the end of the day. But, 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 it was also of his own doing to a degree. So, but some of, their transparency is just so important. I think even with, you know, the pay gap. Yeah. Can, so many can, these, these can I add one thing to that? It. Can I add one thing to that? Sure. I, think, I think that uh, it's, it's great that that executive was, was fired. And, I, and I, I want to add this in a way to bring a little bit of discomfort and a bit of, bit of a question for Megan as well in this. I think that we talk about tech and the industry in a way that lifts it up as this virt, virtuistic thing all the time. 
but that, that CEO and so many others are making well, these decisions yeah. th in a way that's governed by algorithms now, yeah. right? I see it in my uh, political life all the time and how we are narrowing markets and self you know, politicians now get to pick their voters as opposed to the other way around. And that right. certainly is the case uh, in uh, this industry as well. And, and, I, and I just wonder how much all of this is being uh, driven to a, uh, uh, just a dangerous place uh, because of the way uh, data is helping to uh, make a set of decisions uh, in, in these industries now. Yeah, it's, it, this is very serious. Like serious, like we should pause for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> right? And like moment of like wake up. So I think um, the Stanford, MIT, and a bunch of other teams just did something called the AI index. And they're like, how are we going to measure this stuff? So the only way to do something is kind of start. Like when you, same thing for us techies, like we just start kind of prototyping things like you start storyboarding and, you know, you get started. And so the AI teams are looking at how are you going to measure um, where we are, right? And uh, they, we have a huge challenge that the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. And some people are in that world and some people are not. And how are we going to get all of us in there? And the thing is, there's so much noise that the, the only we are going to win is if all of us are in. And if we don't do that, it's not, we're gonna, it's, this is gonna be a mess. So I encourage everyone to watch the TED Talk that Kathy O'Neill just did recently called Weapons of Math Destruction. Uh, and so algorithms are incredibly biased because we're biased and we make them. And one of our greatest challenges is that the culture in the tech sector has tons of intellectual combat and other things that people don't want to work in that. They also have, we've decided through the way we teach math and science, you sort of have this weird idea that there's math people and not math people, but that's not true. It's just we taught poorly or in a way that didn't engage everybody. It's just a, a language. And so this is incredibly important to get into. And that's why it's not the tech people, it's this stuff that all of us need, and that's why computer science for all is what we did with President Obama. You can't graduate from high school in Chicago now without taking coding computer science just like you take freshman biology. That's the that's language, good. and we should all have that mm -hmm. so that we're confident in it. Yeah, it's interesting, though, because there is this issue of the algorithms are just as biased as the people who totally. make them, mm -hmm. right? More like, totally. so more biased. I don't really, s more biased, more biased? Well, yeah, they're, that, they're more extreme. They can really codify it and people all hail the algorithm. In this AI index, I have an essay with a friend from the UN that points to all kinds. Of, it's 100% focused on this problem of inclusion of everybody at the table in the design of what's happening, not in the use of. Yeah, I don't feel like we've got the solution to that yet, though. Oh, I but do. I have the solution. It's just, <laughs> it's old world thinking here, guys. If you don't see yourself represented, don't buy the product, don't support the, yeah. the just don't do it. Uh, it, it and, and, and if you see, I mean, like the movie we saw last night, I mean, I wanted to say something, but I'm like, I'm a juror, I don't know if I get to say something. Yeah. You know, I don't know what that means. So, but it was so diverse mm -hmm. that I was in awe of it. Beautiful. And, and, and uh, why can't, everything be representative of what we see in society. It's easy to do. I don't subscribe to magazines where I don't see every now and again somebody who looks like me. Um, I don't go to movies, and I, I'm a huge movie fan, but if I don't see people who look like me, I don't, you know, I'm like, it's gonna be last on my list because you know yeah. what? I know how hard it is to get these jobs. And I know that there are a lot of women, uh, a a women of color. And when I say women of color, I mean Asian, I mean Latin, I mean Indian, who, and, and, and you know, white women of a certain age um, who aren't getting these jobs. So my thing is, okay, I'm 41. And <laughs> <laughs> I want to see 41 year olds. Um, <laughs> um, we're going to open this up to questions in just a minute, but I want to, if, um, Megan, if you can like speed. Super fast? Yeah. Um, because I brought one some of, images to show you guys yeah. uh, just to get a feel for it. And there's a Churchill quote that says, the farther back you can look, the farther forward you'll see. And that's why it's important to know these true stories. So I don't know. This is the Women's March that we're celebrating from last year, but it's not last year. Mm. This is just as big as the one that everybody wow. did Who in, in here knew about this? Mm -hmm. Not a single one person, two, three. Women's, I call it Women's Missing History Month. <laughs> right? 
You know, and, we're in the centennial of the White House and, protest every and, year. And, and, they, and, they, and they didn't need Facebook or Twitter to get all those people out. It's <laughs> <laughs> right? Or that for 60 years, we didn't recognize the country of Haiti, you know, yeah. in the 1800s. Yeah. Right? And we're back at we it. We still don't. People don't know our history. So you guys know The Invitation Game. This is an incredible film. Turing, Joan Clark, these were real people. Uh, do you know that two-thirds of the people at Bletchley were women? These are the actual code breakers but the film didn't tell you that. Mm -hmm. Kate's grandmother and great aunt were at Bletchley Park. I met a woman who was five years old. She said she was next to the elite math team. Imagine them, World War II elite math team. She said, my mom was always telling us to be quiet. We were loud kids. She always would say, shh, the girls are working. Shh, the girls are working? So here they are, right? Mm -hmm. So these are the American, a league of their own meets computers. These, my friend found these photos. She, they said these women were modeling. Those are the first digital programmers in America. The Mercury 13 astronauts. Seven? 13. Seven? 13. There were astronauts. This is the Mac team that Steve Jobs really had. It's gender balanced. I worked for them on smartphones. Joanna Hoffman, Kate Winslet won the Golden Globe for playing her. She walks out of the film. She's a physics grad from MIT from Eastern Europe, completely intense, and the Steve Jobs sparring partner. Her son said, Mom, did you really iron Steve Jobs' shirt? The stereotype. Which is what's represented in the movie. Yeah, the idea she's his mom, she's not his mom. Right. Uh, this is Ida, one of the greatest American data scientists. And she's intersectional. She's entering Tesla. She and, she and Frederick Douglass protested the World's Fair uh, because African-American people were not allowed to exhibit, but we don't see that in the National Geographic show. The Wright brothers. This is, do you know that the Wright brothers' mom is the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang dad? She's a mechanical genius, and the boys took their projects to learn from their mom. And their sisters, they're Sheryl Sandberg, COO, Duke of Tesla, physicist. We started working on these stories. You know, of course, we know Catherine. This is Margaret Hamilton. She has a Lego. That's her code for all of the Apollo Command modules, Lunar Lander, and Skylab. And when Tom Hanks met her, when they both got the Medal of Freedom, he's like, Margaret, if I knew about you, you would have been in the movie. And I was like, Apollo and Apollo, and it's so finely told. So here she is, here you guys are. So there are 13-year-olds who look like this, just like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates. And so Kimura and Olivia, Olivia made this game. Kimura made this app. It listens for domestic violence in the room, and it helps you call the police. That's a great application for Alexa. So there were four women in space, two women of color. We don't have to smurf these movies or make them like superheroes with one of a kind. These are real stories. There's the Hokulea team. And the reason why it matters is because, thank you, uh, Grace in 10th grade jammed into the computer science team in the spirit of Ida, and she's working right there teaching the police chief in New Orleans how to code because we have data on justice today and we can fix our problems and all our problems on the environment and others. Everybody's in on the game. So that's why I'm here at Sundance to work with all of you guys. I like wow. her. <laughs> I'm getting the rap sign. You guys, thank you so much. You're amazing. Thank you. And thank, so you. Thank, you so thank you all for listening. I get this such a pleasure. Time.